Exodus 31.1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, or Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and understanding and knowledge. And look how this was manifest or deployed in his life. And in all manner of workmanship to design artistic works, to work in gold and silver and bronze and cutting jewels for setting in carving wood and to work in all manner of workmanship. What an anointing to do work with your head, your heart, and your hands. And with that, I'd like to speak to you on Father's Day on the subject, Tools of the Trade. God bless you. Please be seated. I will add a note of appreciation to all of our children's ministries workers who are back in chips while we are in church. They are to be thanked and our parking lot team, everybody who misses church, so we get to attend. Have you ever tried to uh, do a job without the right tools? You didn't have the tool in your toolbox, and you're looking around, and you just don't have the right tool. Have you ever tried to do a job and couldn't find the tool at all? You knew you had it. It wasn't that you didn't own the tool. You just couldn't find it. Have you ever tried to do a job with a tool other than the tool that was designed to do that job? For example, have you ever used a pair of pliers as a hammer? Or a screwdriver as a hammer? More than once. I don't know. I have slot head and Phillips head screwdrivers and star drives and all that. And I don't know why. Every time I pull a screwdriver out, it's the wrong one. It's a slot head. I needed a Phillips. They're supposed to be organized, but they're not. And I remember a time more than once I used my finger as a nail. Not on purpose. Whatever your line of work, it always requires the right tools of the trade. Tools to maintain a home or a car are a common denominator for all men and many women as well. But it's Father's Day, so I'm talking to mostly men today. But even if you're not a good handyman, I'm not the best handyman, you need a lot of good tools and you need to know how to use them. Uh, my dad was a carpenter by trade, and he had a lot of good quality tools. Back in the day, Sears, Craftsman's tools were a lifetime warranty. My dad always tried to buy Sears Craftsman tools, and I've been to Sears with him numerous times, sometimes to exchange, and my dad always had really good tools. That's how he made a living, so he made sure he had the best that he could afford. My dad passed away in 2015. And he retired years before that. He was 88 when he retired. But my dad had so many tools, two sheds of tools. And my brothers, my sister and I, and our kids have enjoyed the tools that my dad left behind that were the tools of his trade and all kinds of other trades that he did. He could kind of do everything, whether it was carpentry or some electrical or almost anything mechanical. My dad was really good, and that's why I'm really not. Because dad always did it. And I tried to watch and learn. And I've used my dad's tools pretty often that my dad handed down to me. And my dad earned a living with his head and his hands. Uh, but he couldn't have built much without adequate tools of the trade. And if you get good tools and a great craftsman, you've got a winning combination. You need the right man to use the right tools if you're going to get the job done right. And the Lord instructed Moses, the man of God, and the leader of Israel to build and completely furnish a portable church called the Tabernacle in the wilderness. Moses was a leader who was raised in a palace in Egypt, and then he worked for 40 years as a shepherd. He was not a craftsman. Moses really wasn't much of a speaker either, uh, but he certainly was not a craftsman. He was a man of God. He talked to God face to face as a man talks to his friend. But the Lord gave him this man named Bezalel to be an overseer 
and a chief, chief craftsman to construct the tabernacle in the wilderness, all of the furnishings and the objects of worship. It's an amazing thing that the Lord filled Bezalel with the spirit of wisdom. Now we talk a lot about spiritual gifts in the church. But sometimes we interpret that as the ability to sing or play an instrument or speak. But I thank God that not everybody wants that gift or has that gift. The same spirit of God that moved on Moses, moved on Bezalel, and gave him supernatural wisdom to be able to know how to work with tools to build a place that God could fill with his glory. God said, I filled him with the spirit of God. Wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and all manner of workmanship. He could do all kinds of things. He was a multifaceted, gifted man, an artesian, a worker. And then, additionally, the Lord gave him another man, Exodus 31 and 5. He gave him a holy ab, and the Bible said, in the hearts of other wise-hearted men, that God put this kind of wisdom to build and to know how to use tools. I've learned that when God calls you to do something for Him in His kingdom, it is always bigger than you, and it doesn't just involve you. But if God calls you, He will give you people with gifts you don't have to accomplish the work of God. And if you can be selfless and get over your ego, you can involve other people to build bigger and better than you could ever do on your own. God will give people in areas that you have no gifting. When God made man, males, he gave them the gifting, the equipment emotionally, mentally, and physically to be a father. There's a lot in the news right now about men who compete as women. And unfortunately for the women who compete, those men are physiologically stronger. They're, they're bigger. Yeah. They've got bigger bones and stronger muscles. And typically they win. Not because men are better, but God equipped men for a role in life just as he did women. Right. Amen. 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 Now... Fathering tools, though, don't always come naturally. They come naturally if you had a good godly father who is a good fatherly role model. But just like acquiring wisdom, it doesn't lay on the surface, as Proverbs says. You've got to mine it. You've got to dig for it. You've got to search for it as hidden gold and, and treasure. And I believe that fathering is like that, that you have to apply yourself, observe good fathers, Educate yourself and develop yourself to be a godly, good father. Amen. Amen. If you're a man, God can help you have the skills of fathering if you are a father or will become a father. Now, I've talked about my dad many times. He's not the star of my sermon today, but he could be. But I want to just remind you that my dad did not have a godly father. My, my, my paternal grandfather was a deadbeat dad. He left their family. He was a gambler. He was immoral. He walked out of my dad's life. My dad turned to sports, which was a good thing. He, he went into the Navy. And when he got out, he was invited to a Pentecostal church where he received the gift of the Holy Ghost, was baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the church... My dad found godly mentors who taught him how to be a father. The church gave me a dad that was godly, that was stable. When my dad passed away, the day before, my dad and mom had been married 66 years. They, he died the day after their 66th anniversary. Many of you have a story like that. You may not have a legacy of six and seven generations, but you had a God who brought a dad out of darkness and he made him a godly father like he did my dad. My siblings and I are blessed beyond measure because the church gave us a godly father. And last night, my brothers and I exchanged a few text messages about our dad and grandfather and how influential both of them were in our lives and how blessed we are because of them. There is a pressing 
urgent need in our culture for men to step up and to be good and godly fathers. Brother Jury quoted some statistics. I want to share some of them in and maybe a few others. 18 and a half million children grow up in homes without a father, which has caused the United States to become the world's leader in fatherlessness, if you can fathom that. 80% single parent homes are led by moms. And I commend the single parents in our church and especially the single parent moms who have continued to be godly and faithful and strong in the spite of a father who was deadbeat and walked out of your kids' lives. So that means 25% of young people grow up without a father in the home. It's a staggering statistic that is destroying the nuclear family, that is unraveling the fabric of our culture in every place it happens. Amen. So if you raise without a dad, five times more likely to live in poverty than a two-parent home. Children without fathers in the home, nine times more likely to drop out of school. 90% of all homeless children run away, or, or homeless children are runaways, or they come from those kinds of homes. 85% with behavioral disorders, and, and all of that. And I want to say to every young man who is unmarried today, that is, it is one thing to father a child. You may be biologically able to father a child, but that does not make you a father in reality. What makes you a father is being present and engaged in that child's life. Amen. That's what makes a father a real dad. Now, I recognize that some men do not know how to be a good father. They had no role model their dad was absent, perhaps abusive. But I've learned to not make excuses, but to make decisions, Amen. to look around. I found men that did some things better than my dad, and I've tried to model my life after them, as well as my amazing father, grandfather, uncles, pastors who were mentors in my life. I'm sincerely sorry for people who were raised in families where they did not have a godly father and I pray that the Lord would help you forgive them and not be bitter against them. I hope that you don't hate men to women, to daughters, you know, and, and sons as well who did not have a father. And I hope God would help you not have an unhealthy desire for a relationship with a man that leads to immorality or perversion, whether you're a girl or a boy. Today, my goal is to encourage to help, to strengthen, not to chastise or try to belittle anyone. For all of us are doing our best to be our best in every role we fill in life. There's not a deadbeat person in this room. You want to be your best. You don't want to be that kind of person who walks off the set and is the cause of all of the, the ills that I've just spoken of. So I want to share some tools for fathering. When God made men, as I mentioned, he gave you the basic tools. The masculine nature, your mind, your will, your emotions, your physique. He made you to be a godly father. Now, there are a lot of neat tools mentioned in the Bible. This was an interesting study for me, something that I've not really done before. To try to find out every tool that was ever mentioned in the Bible, how it was used, why it was used, and uh, to learn a few things about them. And I take a little liberty today, today from Jesus, who liked to use examples, word pictures, metaphors to try to demonstrate a concept he wanted to communicate. He talked about himself as being the bread of light, the light of the world, a good shepherd, and the true vine. He gave us those metaphors of his own self. He spoke of the kingdom of God as seed planted in different kinds of soil as a tiny mustard seed, as yeast and dough, as a net that pulls in all types of fish. So today, I want to use some tools and just make some practical applications with scriptural principles to them. The first tool I want to talk about is what the Bible calls a reed or a measuring line. 
This is a good old new fashioned metal yardstick. In the Bible, reeds are mentioned a lot. They had multiple uses. But reeds are mentioned 19 times in the Bible, 19 times as a measuring device. Ezekiel, Revelation, talks about measuring lines a lot. I was fascinated to go back and read in Revelation 21 when an angel came to John Zebedee, John the Revelator, and he had a golden measuring stick, a golden reed in his hand, and he used that reed to measure the holy city. Now, a typical measuring line was probably 18 inches long, a cubit. Some people say a cubit could have been, could have been 21 inches, but we'll go with 18 as kind of a standard cubit in the Bible. And this angel measured the holy city, the new Jerusalem. It was 1,400 miles long, wide, and tall. Now, I was hoping he had a, la a laser measuring rod. Because if he laid down an 18-inch measuring line until he got to 1,400 miles, John was in a really long vision. 1,400 miles in a cube and walls, 216 feet, maybe thick. In the Bible, a reed was the very best measuring tape that they had. And I want to talk about the reed as a means to standardize. To standardize. A reed set a standard for length that did not deviate. It was, a, it was not a subjective unit of measure. In other words, it wasn't one reed that was 14 inches and one 18 by our measures. It was always the same. It was a cubit. It was what they used to measure whatever they needed to calculate. It wasn't the kind of thing where God said when they were, you were going to measure to each his own. Just do it however you want. It doesn't really matter. Just use your own subjective standard of measure. For us, a yard is always 36 inches. A meter is always 100 centimeters or 1,000 millimeters or in imperial measurements, 39.37 inches. It is always the same on planet Earth. And our cultural structure in the United States and the Western world is crumbling because it is being built by subjective man-made measures. In other words, what has happened is our culture has abandoned the word of God that sets a standard for morality, for life, amen, for salvation, and it never changes. It is forever settled in heaven. You can never, you can never build a sound structure without consistent standards. As a side note, I was looking at Psalm 74 that describes past generations as building and the current generation as tearing down what was built. I intend to study Psalm 74 more. But whether you're building a doghouse or your house or a skyscraper, it pays to not just throw it together. You don't use and match an 8 foot 2 by 4 with a 10 or a 12. If you're building walls, you use the same length of board every time. You don't just say it doesn't matter if the walls are not, or the, excuse me, the corners are not square and the walls are not plumb. If you're going to be a build a house that will stand, you want to make sure you have a standard of measure and you build to the standard every time. There's a building code for life. Amen. It is called the Bible. And we need to build by the Bible and understand that God established a standard that does not deviate, nor should it ever. Reads, measuring devices, standardized. Proverbs 22, 6. Here's a standard of measurement. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old... He will not depart from it. Here's the standard. Ephesians 6 and 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. This is the 
New Living Translation. I, I'm reading this translation on purpose. Rather bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. We do not leave the eternal destiny of our children to chance. Amen. As fathers, we don't say anything's go anything goes. Amen. We don't say just use any length board. Just come in any time you want from being out at night. Hang out with anything, anybody you want. Watch anything you want to watch. We don't do that as fathers, nor do we do that with our mothers in our church. But we say we have a goal. We have a standard that dictates every value, every relationship, every behavior. And our goal is not to dumb down the standard. It's to live up to what God ordained in his word. Amen. So when it comes to involvement at school or extracurricular activities, in our dress, in our alliance with other people, we always make sure that we have the measuring line of God's word to guide us. And we make sure that our conduct measures to this line and not some subject, subjective standard. And every father should stand like Joshua and say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Fathers should say, follow me as I follow Christ. Because of the subjective standards of our world. We're facing fundamental battles in our culture. They go far beyond external uh, dress codes. They go to the internal nature. That's why the external dress guards the internal nature of male and female. Amen. There's a generational shift of those who struggle with gender identity, not because of biology, but because of the conditioning of our culture. And I don't have time to get into that today. But the increase is not because of biology. It's because a different message that does not match the standard of God's word is being taught in schools, in media, and everywhere you turn. But let's get back and let's raise our kids according to the standard of God's word. Reads are measuring sticks that standardize. Amen. Next tool. Not all tools are created equal in time allotted in the sermon. Axes. They cut and they shape. Amen. They cut down trees. They shape. If you've ever seen anyone build with a hatchet or an axe, kind of chop away at what is just a stump and turn it into a piece of artwork. That's because we understand the power in the Bible of an axe. Axe heads were made of iron, but they actually could float. If you were a man of God and work a miracle. But axe heads typically did not float. Axes are tools and not toys. Although Camden was headed for my axe after the first service. Amen. Now I know that your children are perfect, but ours were and are not. And we learned that there are some things about them that needed to be kind of chopped away. Some rough edges, some rebellious nature, some independent thinking. And you say, oh, not me. Well, I'll just quote a verse for you. All we have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. Amen. That's the essence of sin is self-will. So you've got to have a tool. Amen. It's called discipline. That shapes the character and the behavior of your kids. Now, contrary to how this sermon may be abused, I am really not telling you that you should do use an axe to discipline your children. Anyone who says that is lying. But the Bible says that foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. It doesn't say wisdom. And the rod of correction will drive it far from him. A child left to himself will cause his mother shame and his father. That's why 
we give the rod and reproof according to Proverbs 29. So our children do not bring shame on us. We don't let our children choose what they eat, hopefully. We don't let them choose their friends when they're young. We guide them. And especially when they're really young, we mandate what they do because we're teaching them to obey. In the teenage years, we're guiding them to learn how to make wise decisions on their own. Our goal is different. But early in life, we need something that chops away and shapes the moral character of our children. And in the Bible, this tool and axe was used to chop and to shape whatever was being worked with. So here's what I want you to understand. Permissive parents raise problem children. I will say that again. Permissive parents raise problem children. If we don't shape our children with the acts of correction, one day they could become spiritually worthless. John the Baptist spoke about the acts being laid to the root of the tree. And every tree that does not bring forth good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. John the Baptist came preaching repentance, turning from sin to God. But when national Israel refused to repent, John said they have reached the place where they are spiritually incorrigible. There is nothing we can do but just eliminate them and cut them down. So what I'm telling you today is if you do not start early and often and shape your children, there may come a day when their life is spiritually worthless and they are cut down and thrown into the fire of God's eternal judgment. So I'm warning you. I'm encouraging you. I'm challenging you to shape the character and behavior of your children. A little pruning from the axe may save a lot of cutting from the Lord. The next tool I want to talk about is a plow. It's used often in the Bible. It's used to break up hard-packed ground and prepare the soil for planting. Plows are necessary because the ground can be resistant to growth. Isaiah 28 I love this passage. It says, does the plowman plow all day to sow that he open and break the clods of his ground? This plow was made to turn up the soil. There's numerous ways that you can apply what the plow does. The Bible tells us to break up our fallow ground and it's time to seek the Lord. But in speaking of parenting, I want to just relate plowing to cultivating. I want you to see your child as a field that is uncultivated. There's nothing there but dirt, maybe weeds, something growing there that you don't really want. But by God's grace, you come along with godly instruction and correction and good habits. And you begin to cultivate in your child what could become of their future. You see what they could become and you begin to plow into their life. Correction and godliness and instruction. You teach them what is right. And then you talk about it all the time. But if you do that. You have to see the potential harvest. Of what your children could become. You look at a field. And you see a crop. You see something worth spending time with. And you spend time in that field. And you cultivate day by day. Amen. Our children are grown. We have grandkids. That means we get to love them and send them home. <laughs> but I'm reminded again, being around our kids, how much time parenting takes. You don't have a lot of discretionary time. That's because you're cultivating something in the next generation that will pay off big if you will stay with it and cultivate. <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> Cultivating is not a one-day thing. It's not just go to church on Sunday, although that's very important. 
Cultivate is a continual process of loving your children and being with your children, spending time with them and investing in them to help them be their very best for the glory of God. Seats are not always all the same. Isaiah talks about this. And so they have to be cultivated by using different methods. You know the nature of your child. Some need more firmness. Some need more softness. Some need understanding. We adapt our approach to our children according to their nature so we can get the best harvest out of their lives. Good fathers cultivate the potential of their children. They study the nature of their children. Determining the best approaches, I said. They introduce the seeds of greatness to get the very best out of their kids. Plows in the Bible and today they cultivate the soil so that a healthy good crop can grow not just a weed farm but something that is good I shouldn't say weed in 2022 <laughs> sorry the gateway drug files now there's saws in the bible a lot of really cool tools but I selected these on purpose, thinking through <clears throat> how they could be applied. Files. A file is not an axe. If I want to really cut deep, I'm going to swing an axe left-handed. But if I want to just kind of put an edge on a sharper object, I want to make a sharp object sharper, then I'm going to use a file. The files were used often in the Bible. They're mentioned in the Bible and they're a pretty interesting tool. Proverbs 27, 17 says, Iron sharpeneth iron. So a man, the countenance of his friend, the interaction of friends helps sharpen us and make us better. It's a pretty cool verse about friendship. But the application of this is that the purpose of a file is not to grind a blade down to nothing, but it is to just put a little edge to make it more effective at what it does. Files sharpen other tools so that those tools can be more effective in cutting. A file makes other tools better. Now some files like this one are pretty coarse and some are a little bit more fine. And you may need to use both in trying to sharpen your children. Like the grit on sandpaper some is fine, some is coarse. In filing, some files are designed to be coarse and some are fine. But this art of filing is to understand how you can put a sharper edge on your children so that they have every advantage in life. Amen. If you sharpen the blade, you can do the work quicker if you're cutting down a tree or whatever you're doing in life. Wise father. Do not grind on their children until there's nothing left of them. Until they're hopelessly discouraged. Wise fathers use relational finesse to bring out the best in their children. You know, sometimes in our culture we say, I'm honing my skills, right? That's a, that's a figure of speech that I'm trying to get better at what I do, whatever that might be. And that's the idea of trying to, to file, to hone, to perfect your children so that when you release them in life to do the work that God has called them to do, they're as sharp mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and with their giftings that they can possibly be. We want to maximize their potential that God has put inside of them so they can be their very best. So file away, but file carefully. To help be the best that they can be. Now I've already talked about Ephesians 6 and 4. Where the Apostle Paul said to provoke not your children. But I want you to see Colossians 3.21. A kindred verse. Fathers. Provoke not your children to anger. Lest they be discouraged. To not provoke means. To not embitter them. To not exasperate them. To not aggravate them. The kids 
I see some boys looking at me right now. They're going, man, I'm going to memorize this line from Pastor John's right now. And I'm going to use it on my parents when we get home today. Don't pile me down to nothing. Don't beat the daylights out of me so you knock the wind out of me. Amen. The harshness of some parenting causes kids. Paul said to the Colossians, lest they be discouraged. I kind of see it as a punch to the solar plexus that knocks the wind out of your kids where one translation says they lose heart. NASB, in a, in a, several translations use that phrase, they do not lose heart. I told you I'm a former youth pastor. I'm a youth pastor in an older body. They made me become a pastor. You can't be a youth pastor anymore. You're too old. Something like that. But I have seen many, many kids who because of the way they were parented, it's like somebody knocked the wind out of them. They didn't have motivation because instead of love, balance with discipline, it was discipline with no balance. It was correction without encouragement. So this file today, I'm encouraging you to use the file to sharpen your kids and to make them the best they can be for the glory of God. <laughs> Files sharpen. <clears throat> hammers. I have several of my dad's hammers. I'm pretty sure this is one of his. Mine would never look this old and used. <clears throat> hammers secure. Now, they're common tools in the Bible. They can beat metal into shapes. Big hammers, sledgehammers can break rocks. The Bible talks about the word of God like a hammer that breaks the rock. But hammers can also drive nails and pegs to secure them into a wall. That's the way I want to imagine the work of a hammer today. That a hammer works to secure or to fasten. Isaiah 22, 23. Speaking of Eliakim, Isaiah, the Lord said, And I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place. And he shall be a glorious throne to his father's house. The Lord said, I'm going to take Eliakim and I'm going to fasten him to a wall. So that you can hang the hopes of a generation on him. It says in the next verse, they shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house. He's going to be so strong and secure that you can trust him to not budge and not move. So today, I want to encourage every father that above every other thing, that you work to secure the salvation of your children. That you fasten them to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That ultimately, with everything else you do, your number one goal is to drive truth deep into their hearts. To fasten them to the walls of the church so they never fall out. Fasten their faith. Secure their salvation. Salvation is not optional. It's not like, well, are you going to be a plumber or a carpenter? Are you going to be an orthodontist or a pharmacist? You know, you could be either one. All things being equal, you can still be saved. But when it comes to salvation, there are no acceptable options. There's no alternatives. If you're saved, other things matter. But if you're not saved, nothing else matters. That's why the number one job of a father and a mother is to make sure you're fastening the hearts of your kids to the Lord Jesus Christ. With kindness and love, fathers need to drive home the importance of salvation to their children. The hammer's job is to secure 
And similarly, fathers should do everything in their power. Whether you're building walls or setting floor joists or ceilings, whether you're building a doghouse, as I said early, or your house or the Lord's house, you've got to have a nail in a sure place that doesn't vibrate loose, that is strong enough to hold. And so I encourage you to secure the salvation of your family. And I hope you see that I'm trying to pound this thought home today. I've worked with my dad just a little bit. I wish it could have been more. He usually left the house. I went to school. He went to work. He worked for someone else. But I built a few things with my dad, a deck. I finished the basement. I worked with my dad when we worked at my grandparents' home. I've seen him start a nail. And then with like, bam, set that nail. He was so strong in what he did. And I was thinking about that imagery, about this, that we need to make sure we set this nail deep. It's not a little tap here and a tap here. This is eternity. This is salvation. This is heaven or hell. And it's got to be all or it is nothing. Drive truth deep into the hearts of your children. Drive your children to church. Tell them Bible stories. Teach them the plan of salvation from their earliest ages. We had a pattern. The thing that we did in our boys started with Ryan. Ryan, how many gods are there? The right answer was one. What's his name? Jesus. What well, can he do? Anything. We want our boys to know, wanted our boys to know that there is one God, that his name is Jesus, and that he can do anything. It doesn't matter what happens in your life, what you confront in your life. There's a God in heaven. There's only one. His name is Jesus. You can call on his name, and he can do anything. There's nothing too hard for him. I wanted to quote over our boys. And over every grandchild, the first thing I said to them when I held them in my arms, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Every child, every grandchild, I wanted them to understand the essentiality of salvation, the essentiality of repentance, of baptism, of receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. I wanted to pound it home in their lives. Try to do my best as a father to secure their salvation and fasten them to a relationship with God. I'm not saying that to say that I've been perfect or we've done everything right, but that we understand the value of a soul that will live forever somewhere. So on Father's Day, I encourage you to make sure your family knows what really matters in life, that we would secure their salvation. So what have I said? I've said that reeds, they standardize, right? Axes cut in shape. Plows cultivate. Files sharpen. And hammers secure. Building godly children is the reason that God gave fathers the tools of the trade. And in the same way that God gave Bezalel and Aholiab the giftings to construct the tabernacle in the wilderness, God gave every Father here, the raw ingredients to build and develop the tools of the trade of fathering. And if you've got deficits in your life because you didn't have a father or your father took you in the wrong direction instead of building you, destroyed you, tried to destroy you, whether purposely or unwittingly, today is a brand new day. You don't have to be the product of your environment. However it has shaped you to this day, Jesus Christ can remake you and reshape you to be a man of integrity, a man that knows how to use the tools of the trade of fathering.